All right, we'll be reading um, from, what is it, Matthew chapter, what was the chapter again? 16, verse 13. I wrote it down, but don't know where it's from. So it's 13 to 20. Matthew 16, 13 to 20. This is where Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. So when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Matt, for uh, leading us in uh, prayer and reading. Um, a couple quick things I forgot before before we get into the message today. First of all, uh, in two weeks on a Sunday after church, we're going to have a newcomer's luncheon. If you are new to Grace Valley Church, we're going to invite you for a quick lunch where uh, Mark and I will be there, and you can learn a little bit more about Grace Valley Church, uh, what makes us tick, what, what our mission is, you know, a bit of the history of the founding of GVC, that kind of stuff. Uh, we'd love to have you join Office of Grace Valley Church. If you are a Redeemer student, I see a few Redeemer students here, or a, a recent grad or something like that, and you think, well, I'm just, you know, looking for a place to hang out on Sunday mornings while I'm in school, we still are willing to give you free food. And you love free food, so come to the luncheon. Uh, we're happy to provide it. Office of GraceValleyChurch.ca to sign up. That's in two weeks. That's September 26th, I think. Also, I'm not sure we've done this yet, so I just want to single out Nick and Chantel, who got married this summer. I don't think I had a chance to, to, to make everybody turn and look and congratulate them. So Nick, and is Chantel here too? Yes, Chantel is beside you. Okay, Chantel, it's because of the mask. I know what you look like, actually. I married you for crying out loud. There they are. Raise your hands so everybody can clap. <laughs> whoop, whoop. That's awesome. And then Eric and Victoria got engaged this summer. You don't even know who I'm talking about. It's okay. They're right beside Nick and Chantel. Can you guys put up your hands and we can congratulate you on your engagement? All right, uh, this morning we are starting a new series uh, called Metaphors of the Church. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a number of metaphors that the Bible uh, gives us to help us understand the purpose of the church, the mission of the church, etc. And we're doing this basically because we're hoping that we're back to, we're back to some sort of normal rhythm of church life. If you saw my pastoral video, I talked about, uh, you know, the fall and what we're hoping to accomplish this fall and what we're hoping will, uh, will be a return to sort of normal rhythms of ministry as well as starting some new ministries. And so we're going to look at these metaphors together. There's six of them. There's more actually, but we're going to look at six of them that give us a bit of a window into what the church is like what the church is supposed to be like because what we like to say here at Grace Valley Church is we're an aspirational church. We talk a lot about what the church is like and we see that as an aspiration. We know that we are not even close to being what we ought to be. But these windows uh, allow us to see what we are striving toward as a church. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at the metaphor of a church as an embassy. An embassy. Now, the word is not used anywhere in the New Testament. 
But when you take what the, what, the, what the New Testament says about the church and you sort of put them together, you do get this picture of an embassy. And we see that right away in the passage that we're looking at this morning where Jesus says um, in um, verse 18 and 19, he says, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And what Jesus is doing here is he is connecting this thing called the kingdom of heaven with the church. He's, he's joining them together. Now, this is the, the first place where the word church is actually used in the New Testament. And it is Jesus who uses that word to describe this thing that he's establishing on earth, which is going to be connected to his kingdom, which he says is the kingdom of heaven. What is this kingdom of heaven? It's not, it's the kingdom of heaven. It's not the kingdom of earth. It's, it's not here, and yet it is here. What, what is Jesus getting at? In, in John chapter 18, where Jesus is having this exchange with Pilate, maybe you remember this, uh, uh, reading this, before he goes to the cross, he has this exchange with Pilate, and Pilate says to him, uh, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? And then Jesus says something interesting. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. And of course, as we even heard in uh, Mark's prayer just a few minutes ago, uh, Jesus teaches us to pray, your kingdom come on earth, where? As it is in heaven. So Jesus has this kingdom that is a a heavenly kingdom. It's, It's from another place. And yet... He connects it to this world through the church. Because the church acts as an embassy, you see, of this kingdom of heaven. What is it? What is an embassy? An embassy acts as an an outpost of one nation within another nation. So if you go to Ottawa and you go to the United States Embassy, what you'll find is you'll find a building there where the flag of the United States of America is being, um, uh, being flown. And when you enter into that place, you are actually entering into a piece of the United States within Canada. When you go in there, you're on U.S. soil, but you're in Canada, but you're on U.S. soil. Because the embassy is, is a, a, a taste of, it is a piece of, a home nation within a host nation. And the church acts the same way here. The church is a piece of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Whenever you are part of the church, you are experiencing, to some degree, a a, a piece of, a part of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Now, of course, uh, it's not a geographical place when you enter the church, even though you guys are here at 20 Bill Melville Street and we're having a church service, this place, this space is not the church. If you want to go to the United States Embassy in, the, in Ottawa, it's at 490 Sussex Drive, and that is the location of the embassy. But that's not how it works with the church. Notice that Jesus says uh, to Peter, he's, he's asking his disciples, you know, who do people say that I am? who they think they are, think we are, and uh, the disciples say, well, some of you think you're Moses or Elijah or some of the other prophets or something like that. And Jesus says, well, who do you think that I am? Who do you, sorry, who do you think that I am? And Peter, speaking on behalf of the other disciples, he says, you are the Messiah or you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And immediately Jesus says, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. So what Jesus is doing is saying that you, Peter, as a person, as as representatives of the disciples, and the confession that you're making, and this is extremely important, okay, the confession that you're making, that I am the Christ, I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that constitutes the church. In other words, the church, you will find the church wherever you find the people of God 
confessing the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's where you find the church. That's where you find an embassy of the kingdom of heaven. Our, our confession of faith, we're Presbyterians, for those of you who don't know. Our confession of faith is the Westminster Confession of Faith. And in it, it says the church is the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. We operate as an embassy of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Wherever you find the church gathered in the name of Jesus, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, you find the church and you find an embassy. Now, okay, if the church is an embassy of the kingdom of heaven, what does it do? What does an embassy do? And simply put, what an embassy does is an embassy administers the affairs of the home nation within the host nation, okay? It administers the affairs of the home nation within the host nation, and it does that kind of in two, two ways. Well, look what it says in verse 19. It says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That is not like Jesus. You know those, those stories of uh, somebody did something awesome, and then they have this ceremony in the city, and the mayor has some big fat key, and he gives a big fat key to this person, and they hold up the key, and the key doesn't open anything. It's symbolic, right? It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a prize of some sort. Jesus is not doing that here. When he gives them the keys, he's also not abdicating his responsibility and saying, well, I'm not in charge anymore. I'm off to heaven, and you guys are going to run the show while I'm gone. No, what he's doing is, is he's saying, I am granting the church authority to speak in my name, to administer the affairs of my kingdom in my name. Well, how does it do that? Well, how does, how does, how does the church act on behalf of Christ in the world? Two ways. Externally, it's got its external relations or external affairs, and then it's got its internal relations, its internal Affairs. Let's talk about each of those in turn. First of all, external relations. What an embassy does is it represents the home nation to the host nation. So if you go to the United States Embassy in Ottawa, you walk in there, you see the you know, U.S. flag, they're going to speak English because that's their official language. You're going to see cultural symbols of the United States. You're going to talk to people from the United States who, who know the United States and are United States uh, citizens themselves. And so what you get is, is you get a taste of the culture of the USA because you are literally experiencing a piece of the USA. And the role of the church is to represent the kingdom of heaven here on earth, to declare, if I can put it this way, what a kingdom under the administration of the God who created us and redeemed us through Jesus Christ, what that should look like. It's a picture of life under God's rule. Now, we're going to see what that looks like further in the other metaphors that we're going to look at over the, com the coming weeks. But here's what I want you to think about. If you have an unbelieving colleague or friend or neighbor or family member, they're not a Christian, they're not a follower of Jesus Christ, when you introduce them to this community, the church, not the building, remember, but the people, what should happen is that they get a taste they get an experience of an alternative community. They get a taste or an experience of a, of a community that, that operates under different rules and has different values than what they are used to. Now, that's not going to happen just showing up in one church service, probably. Well, I suppose it could. But as they're increasingly exposed to the community, they start experiencing a community that, that, that values things like humility and love and gentleness and compassion. A, a community that values things like modesty and patience and, and deferential, is deferential to one another. They should be able to say they do things different here. These people do things different here because it's an alternative nation. 
It's not like the nation that I'm a part of and I'm from. So it represents the home, na- home nation within the home nation, but it also declares the interests of the home nation within the host nation, okay? It promotes the home nation's values and agenda with the nation that they find themselves within. So, for example, lots of talk right now about the relationship between Canada and China, right? Um, The Canadian Embassy, of course, is trying to promote trade with China and try to develop business relationships with China. They try to influence legislation in China, but they're also called to do things like challenge the human rights record of China because we value as Canadians universal human rights and promote the agenda of of Canada within China. And in the same way, the church promotes Christ's agenda. Whenever we gather together here and a guy like me, a minister of the gospel, stands up and declares that Jesus Christ is Lord, and every time you stand up and you sing songs declaring that Jesus is the Son of God, you are saying things that are crazy to our world. That there is someone out there who deserves our absolute, complete, and utter, unconditional allegiance because he is God in the flesh. And he loves us and has demonstrated us that to us by dying, there it is, dying on a cross for you and for me. Whenever we declare that to people, whenever we declare like we did in our time of confession, be reconciled to God, world. Whenever we say that, we're pushing an agenda. You Christians are agenda-driven. Yes, we are, openly and boldly. But you know what? Our agenda is to see you in the glorious kingdom to come, celebrating forever and ever with all God's people Jesus' work of redemption. That's our agenda. It's not a secret agenda. It's a very open agenda. And we promote the values of the kingdom of God. We promote the values that, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us in his word. So when we say abortion is wrong and we say racism is wrong because every human being has been created in the image of God and is loved and cherished by him and deserves to be treated with dignity and respect, we're promoting an agenda. Yes, we're pushing values. Yes, the values of the kingdom. We're declaring them to the world because that's our role as an embassy. Okay? Okay. That's the external side of things. But an embassy also exists to, uh, to operate internal affairs, an internal enge- agenda as well. So what do I mean by that? Basically this. It means that an embassy is there to assist citizens of the home nation as they live and travel and operate within the host nation. So you travel to another country, let's say a crime gets committed against you while you're traveling or visiting or something, let's say you get sick, you get very ill, maybe even get arrested, like what happened to the Kovrigs, uh, to Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavro in China. When that happens, the embassy gets involved. You call the embassy and the embassy gets involved. They advocate for you or they provide resources for you. They and, and actually, in extreme cases, if the host nation you're traveling in, let's say it falls into chaos, right? Like, let's say while you're in some far-off, far-flung place, all of a sudden there's a coup, and, like, everything's falling apart, like what happened in Afghanistan recently, you book it to the embassy as a Canadian citizen. And the embassy is there to protect you in experiences like that. Well, the church exists for the same purpose, The church is the place where you are cared for. Scripture calls us to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice. When you are, you are part of a church community or a church family, that community is called to walk, to journey, to do, you know, the cool language we use, we do life together. Sorry, I shouldn't be, I, I actually want to do that, so I shouldn't like make fun of the term. <laughs> do life, do life together. I'm getting old, right? So every new term, always I kind of roll my eyes at it, but I should adopt some of them. And that's a good one. Do life together. The church is meant to be the place where you find encouragement. 
when you, when you go to an embassy in a far off country and you've been traveling in that country for a long time, you walk into the embassy, what you're supposed to experience is a taste of home. That's it. This is a taste of my home away from home. Well, friends, you and I, our real home, our eternal home, our forever home, is with Christ in the new creation, in the new heavens and the new earth. New earth. Heaven is not our home, no. But earth is not our home either. It is the new creation. That is our home. We are strangers and aliens in this world in the sense that we are citizens of an alternative kingdom that is our true home. And whenever we gather as the church, we're supposed to be in a place that, that feels like home, that fits, because the values of the kingdom are proclaimed. And we share those values. The message of the kingdom is proclaimed. And we share that message. We believe that message. The church is your taste of home away from home. Now, let me close. I'm going fast, I know. By applying this. But I want to apply that. There, now, there are many ways to apply this, okay? Many, many ways to apply this. Uh, this metaphor and looking at the clock, I'm like, oh, maybe I can add two or three. But that always gets dangerous when I do that on the fly. So I won't do that. I will stick with the one major uh, application that I wanted to, to share with you. And, it, and it's related to this question or this issue of us reengaging the worshiping life of the church, right? For 18 months, we've been worshiping from our couches, Sometimes that's awesome, let's face it. It's pretty cool to be in your PJs, have your coffee, kids go play with Lego so you can focus maybe, you know. I remember, I remember when we were recording services in the summer of 2020, and we did that for most of the summer of 2020. At, at, at one point, I was just like, I was like, boy, this is awesome. Man, I'm like done work on Friday. I got my weekends back. I haven't had weekends for 15 years. I got my weekends back, watch TV, like watch church, and then you like just like roll right into lunch. And it was so smooth and relaxing and wonderful. And so getting back into like this can be tough. It can be hard. But listen, think about this. The church is an embassy for the citizens of the kingdom of God. You, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have put your trust in him, now, understand, when I say you are a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't mean that you are not a sinner. I don't mean that you are a person who never commits wrong and does everything that Jesus wants and you live a perfectly upstanding life. Not at all. To be a follower of Jesus Christ is to be a person who acknowledges openly and honestly, I am a mess. I make a muck of my life up all the time. I am not qualified, frankly, to be in control of my life. And therefore, I submit myself to this Jesus who is perfectly gracious and loving, who says to me, I am gentle and humble in heart, and come to me, all you who are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. I am coming to him, finding rest in him, and now I am following him as best I can, not on my own, but with a community knowing that he forgives me whenever I fail and even when I doubt, and we're going to talk about that right now. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You know, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, somewhere, Paul says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. I just said that you were foreigners and strangers, but you're, you're foreigners and strangers here. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And in Philippians chapter 3, he says this, our citizenship is in heaven. You'd think I'd be able to memorize that. It's pretty short. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are citizens with one another of an alternative community. Yes, okay, I'm a Canadian. I know that. And I'm, I'm white. 
and I'm a middle-aged white male in Canada, so I, I know that I have, uh, there are certain things about me that define who I am in the here and now, but, but ultimately I am first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of God. And this has huge, this needs to have huge implications. A Christian, friends, should really, should really never feel like they quite fit here. You should always feel a little bit out of place here. I'll give you an example. We're in the middle of the election. I'm watching the debates. I'm not a super political wonk, but I, I like politics a bit, and so I follow it pretty closely. And so I watch the debates, and I listen to the speeches, the stump speeches of the different, uh, the different leaders, and they all say, every single one of them says, I'm speaking up for the regular guy or girl, the regular man or woman here in Canada. I understand Canadian values, and I'm standing up for those Canadian values. And then they start spouting off their policies and stuff, and I'm like, I kind of like that one. I think that one stinks. I kind of like that one. I think that one stinks. And I say that about each and every one of them. And I've come to conclude, none of you guys speak for me. None of you do. Because your value system, because the, 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 the grid with which you're working is not the value system, it's not the grid that I'm working with. Listen, our culture is awash, friends, awash in something called expressive individualism, which you can basically boil down to, you do you. You do you. Everybody is free to do as they please, choose what they want, live how they want. And you, you think, well, in a pluralistic society, well, that, that's a good thing. Eh? We shouldn't all be coerced to, to, to live a certain way and to behave a certain way. Isn't that a good thing? You do you. No, it's not a good thing, not according to Scripture. You know what we just sang a few minutes ago? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. That is not the anthem of our era. Prone to wander. Wandering is good. Self-discovery is good. Live the way you want. Live how you feel. And I feel out of touch with that. I remember watching the Olympics. And this has been written about by others, but I remember watching the Olympics and, and, and uh, hearing all this talk about how people have overcome all kinds of diversity, or adversity, I should say, and they have done it on their own, and they had, they had overcome all these, these obstacles, and they had uh, uh, risen to the top because of their grit, and because of their strength, and because of their power. And I'm like, you know, there's people in places like Afghanistan with a lot of grit, and a lot of strength, and a lot of power, but the, the political system that they live under has made it virtually impossible for them to stand where you stand. Where's the humility? And much of the coverage was kind of an advertorial for a lot of the uh, um, more sexually pro progressive uh, uh, agendas of our culture right now, and I'm thinking, what does what does any of your, what does your sexual identity or orientation, what on earth does that have to do with how fast you swim? And what's interesting is, is that if you are a millennial or you are a Gen Z right now, and you hear me say that, you're, you're probably a little more uncomfortable with me even mentioning that than you are with the idea that the Olympics was basically an advertorial for uh, progressive sexual ethics. What am I getting at? What am I saying? I'm getting at this. We spend most of our time out there in the world. I'm reading a book right now. I got some stats for you that says that for people aged 15 to 23, the average amount of time they spend on social media a year is about 2,700 hours. 2,700 hours a year. If they are a Christian, the average amount of time they spend under the influence of spiritual Christian teaching in comparison is about 290 hours a year. 
2,700 versus 290. What's my point? I can't remember. You're constantly listening to the narrative. You're constantly hearing the perspective. You're constantly being told the values, etc. And after a while, you can start to think you're crazy for thinking differently. You can. You can. It it happens to me. I spend all my time, all my time, thinking about the Bible and applying the Bible and reading the Bible and praying the Bible. I think I spend all my time doing that. And I feel the weight of the pressure of the culture around me. I can only imagine what it's like for you guys. There was a study done, if I have it right, where... um, People were asked to get in an elevator, and I've, tr- I've actually done this, okay, just to see what it's like. Get in an elevator where it's full of people, and everybody, what's the natural thing to do? You get into the elevator, then you turn around, and you face the doors, right? And everybody's facing the doors. You get in the elevator, and you don't do it. I've done this with my wife, actually, and she <laughs> rolls her eyes. And you don't do it. You just face everybody else, you know, like this. And, you know, you look crazy. When I do it, I look crazy. But, but this is what the study has shown, is that the pressure to turn around is enormous. Because that's convention. If everybody out there said the sky was blue and you said it, you were convinced it was purple, the pressure to conform and to believe, well, okay, maybe it's blue. It's, it's, it's massive. It's huge. We are being catechized by the world. When you come to church, and remember, it's the people, it's not the building, but when you are the church, when we gather, you know what happens? You hear the truth of God. You sit under the truth of God. You sing the truth of God. You pray the truth of God. You look at each other and you say there are others who believe the truth of God I'm not crazy I didn't drink the Kool-Aid you gather strength from being together and you might say to yourself well but you know isn't it good to be out in the world where there is diversity of opinion it's not good to be in a group of people where everybody thinks the same way what what do you think is happening when you're out in the world and scrolling through Instagram and looking at TikTok videos, you are listening to people who all think the same way. It's just various versions of you do you. But you come here. And it's like a it's like it's like smelling salt. <sighs> Wake up. You've been under enchantment, under a spell. And you go, yeah, I have been. And you look around and you hear people. I, I just love when you sing. And I can't see you do it anymore, which sucks. But I know you're doing it because I hear it. And I, I hear people basically confessing a faith in the midst of a world that thinks so radically differently. That's what you get when you come to church. You, you, you walk into the embassy and you get reminded of a truth that you believe in the face of overwhelming pressure not to. Okay. And then last thing. As a citizen of this kingdom, this is an eternal kingdom, this is a future kingdom. Think about this. This is a kingdom that does not... Oh, wait. I have a quote for you about the last thing. Worldliness is what... I can't read my note. Oh, yeah. Worldliness is whatever makes righteousness look strange and sin look normal. Worldliness is whatever makes righteousness look strange and sin look normal. And you're sitting under a constant barrage of sin being made to look normal and your righteousness made to look strange. You're a, I'm, I'm gonna give, I know I'm talking about sexual stuff, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use one illustration, okay? I, Jess and I went, to, we went camping this summer, and I was just like, I, I don't think I can go to the beach anymore. Because, because of how I saw women dressed. You never see men wearing these things. Maybe in Europe, 
Thank the Lord, of course, that we never see men wearing these things. But here's the thing. If you, if you raise this, and I'm not, I'm not like an uber prude. I'm not like women should be wearing sacks, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But when you raise this and you say, boy, that just seems a little over the top, don't you think? You get these looks of like, what kind of prude are you? What kind of puritanical, you know, repressed, sexually repressed, patriarchal pig are you? So righteousness, which is the modesty. Modesty. Just asking us to be brothers and sisters with one another and think about one another as we consider how we're going to present ourselves to each other. Modesty. Is that all that outrageous? It looks strange in our culture. And flamboyance looks normal. That was my illustration. Last thing. You're in... You're part of a kingdom that will not fade, that will not spoil, that will last forever. Its values, its virtues, its agenda will never, ever, 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 ever end. It will never be usurped. There are many things that you think right now that your grandparents never thought. And they thought stuff, and maybe sometimes they even say them, and you go, whoa, I can't believe I just heard you say that. You can't say that anymore. We don't think that anymore. Because the values of the culture are always changing. They're always turning over. And if you want to keep in step, man, you better learn a new vocabulary every couple of years. But the kingdom of God will last forever, and its values will go on forever. And it will never end. What makes more sense, investing in that kingdom or this one? building a portfolio, building a retirement fund, amassing of reputation, whatever, or investing in the kingdom of God that will never end? You know the answer, so I'm not going to explain it anymore to you. Let's pray. Father, there is so much more to the idea of a church as empathy but we've, we have scratched the surface and we pray that the things we've learned you will sink deep into us. May we be for one another truth tellers, truth believers. May we be ambassadors. A whole part of this that we didn't even touch on, but may we be ambassadors of Jesus in the world we live for his glory. Amen.